Well, welcome everyone to Geohug. And so we're kicking off our second morning tea session, bringing the Canadians down under. So I'm so pleased that we've got Jean Bernard with us today. Uh, so Jean works with the uh, Geological Survey of Canada and he's been there since 1988. And I'm so pleased that he's joined us. He'll be talking with us about his research uh, on a mantle overturn model for the Archean Earth and with possible implications for mineral exploration. So thank you so, so much. And yeah, it's wonderful having you. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it's nice to have you here. Um, we've all seen this sort of framework for uh, what ore deposit, how ore deposits fit in uh, in a geotectonic context, and you know this this works. Uh, normal ridges have copper rich VMS, and back arc spreading ridges have more lead and zinc because the subduction zone brings those elements down, and porphyry coppers are formed above arcs. You no, know, this this is just common sense, and it works. The question is, how far back can we extrapolate that sort of methodology? How far back does plate tectonics actually go? Uh, here we see the distribution of Archean cratons, and not much of them left, but they have a lot of ore deposits in them, so it's obviously of interest to understand uh, how they formed. It might help us find more. So just to make sure we're on the same page and we speak the same language, we, it's important we have a, a common definition for what plate tectonics is. So I'm giving you mine, and I, I see three fundamental elements. One is large-scale long-lived crustal mobilism. All the different parts of the crust are moving all the time. Where they converge uh, and both bits are buoyant, well, then it's quite common to get major collisional origins like the Himalayas. Where buoyant bits are dragged down by the subduction zone, well, it's common to form accretionary origins. Where the down going, where the, the um, one of the two plates is, is much denser than the other, what often happens is you have uh, active oceanic subduction. The oceanic lithosphere is plunging under the upper plate here and creating a large magmatic arc of some kind. Where plates diverge, whether it's continents diverging or, or uh, divergence caused by slab pull, a uh, new oceanic lithosphere is formed at spreading centers by seafloor spreading. So these are the three fundamental elements uh, of plate tectonics. Uh, the only ones that's really testable in the deep past is the presence of subduction zones because of the preservation uh, story. Uh, I mean, people have claimed that continental crust itself is formed by subduction. So obviously they must have left some records. So this is what we're going to be testing in the talk. Well, the first people who went to look at Archean uh, terrains, without knowing they were Archean, uh, quickly saw that they were radically different from um, uh, more recent Phanerozoic rocks because they have this characteristic dome and basin pattern <clears throat> with big granitoid domes and pinched synclines of uh, uh, mostly of basalt. And um, many people have proposed this that, that uh, basically the thick volcanic carapace is too dense and the, the granitoids beneath are too soft and, and buoyant and the, 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 the supercrustals just sink into it by sagduction or partial convective overturn. And this is indicated by uh, linear stretchings in uh, uh, lineation, uh, radial stretching lineations, uh, crush zones with uh, huge l tectonites. And most people working near Archean now accept that this actually happens. Uh, unfortunately, for the last 20 or so years, uh, the whole community has been bogged down in a red herring debate about whether it's vertical or horizontal tectonics. Uh, in fact, the real question isn't whether there was vertical or horizontal tectonics. Both existed in the Archean. The real question is how do you get horizontal tectonics without an arc? So let, let's recap why people believe in Archean plate tectonics. There, there are several really bad reasons that I left at the bottom that I won't actually mention. Uh, but there are two quite good reasons. Uh, the first good reason is that there is solid evidence for Archean compressional fabrics and possibly terrain assembly, which requires there be some sort of horizontal tectonics to, and convergent margins to bring these things together. In the second, the question is, is plate tectonics the only way to do this? And in the second part of the talk, I'll present alternative models that I think better explain the data. The second uh, leg on which uh, the uh, Archean plate tectonic hypothesis uh, rests 
is the fact they're calc alkaline volcanics uh, and TTG complexes that constitute the actual con continental crust that are equated with arc magmas formed in subduction zones. I'm going to argue that's just not true. And that once we kick these two legs out from the hypothesis, the whole thing is going to crash down and we're going to need a better hypothesis, which is how science works. So um, after about 20 years of working in the Appalachian origin, uh, working on ophiolites, uh, accretionary origin, you know, classic uh, plate tectonic origin with all the bells and whistles, I thought I'd dip my toe in the Archean Lake. And um, I did this by joining the uh, Quebec government survey who, was ma who were mapping the entire Northeast Superior Craton at 250,000 scale uh, over the course of four summers. Um, uh, this was a great learning experience. When I first went there, I was quite happy with the plate tectonic hypothesis. And when I left, I didn't believe it at all. <laughs> so that, I guess that's a positive result. Uh, the problem with the Northeast Superior is that it, you're 10 kilometers depth, everything's at amphibolite grade or just about, and the volcanics are trashed. So I, I felt I really needed to look at volcan you know, well-preserved Archean volcanic rocks to better understand how the calc alkaline rocks form. So I jumped at the chance when Francois de Claire uh, solicited Lyle and I to co-direct his uh, thesis in the Abitibi, which is this, this gigantic green thing here, which is actually bigger than the Pilbara and Barberton terrain combined. Now, uh, I don't want to badmouth all the fabulous work that's been done there. Uh, these are classic areas, but they're small and they're too small for you to be able to see the big picture. You know, this is the tail of the elephant and this is the trunk of the elephant. And if we want to see the whole elephant, we have to look at an elephant sized block, which is the superior craton. Now, the superior craton is thought to be a collage of terrains, and in the uniformitarian interpretation, it's arcs, arcs, arcs. The whole northern superior is a bunch of north-south trending arcs that got jammed together, and the southern superior is the result of adding a whole bunch of arc terrains, microcontinents, oceanic plateaus, you know, the usual story, to the northern block, which is known as the Canoran orogeny that started in the north around 2720 and finished in the south around 2670. Now, there's no doubt there's compression in the Archean. Now, you just have to look at, at uh, diagram, aeromagnetic gradient maps like this, where the granitoids form these rigid bodies and the soft ductile green stones form these interfering fold patterns. And, uh, you know, obviously this thing's been flattened in some way. And the uh, seismic profile across the Southern Superior clearly shows some sort of imbricated structure. So no doubt there's overprinting compression. What we mustn't forget is that the uh, orogenic style we see in the Archean is completely different from what we see in the Phanerozoic. You never see these gigantic bivergent thrust and fold belts. And there's a very simple reason for that. It's just the crust was too soft. It was too soft to allow propagation of major thrust faults in the lower crust. Uh, brittle normal faults, <laughs> brittle faults, I must emphasize. Uh, in the in the Proterozoic, and, well, the early Proterozoic and the Archean, origins look very different. They're much softer because they're hotter. And typically you get things that look like this, hot origins, where everything gets flattened. And at some stage you start slipping in strike slip fault mode, uh, but you never develop much relief because the crust is too soft, but it's hot. So it flows laterally up. And this often overprints this sort of thing. Remember, the, these things are sinking into their substrates because the substrates are hot. And then they caught up in these compressional deformation events that accentuate this. Imagine you have a granite diapir and you squeeze it. Well, you're going to squeeze the pip up even faster. So compressional orogenesis act, actually accentuates the partial convective overturn pattern. Now, <clears throat> Notwithstanding the difference in orogenic style, if you have an exotic terrain and you're trying to jam it up against an older continent uh, along a subduction zone, uh, today what we see in Phanerozoic origins is this whole sweep of suture zone rocks, ophiolites, subduction melanges, oceanic terrains, you know, the, the usual story, high pressure rocks, 
uh, this diagram from Stern, you can see the restricted age distribution of blue schists and, and other high pressure rocks that are only form in subduction zones. But uh, Bob's talked about this a lot, so I, I'm not going to repeat that. I'm more of an ophiolite guy, so I'm going to emphasize the ophiolites, which show pretty much the same distribution. Uh, pretty common after one billion years, rare as hen's teeth before, and none at all in the Archean. Now, ophiolites are not subtle little things, right? They're pretty big. This is Bay of Islands. It's been through three orogenic pulses, and uh, it's Still looking pretty good, uh, totally, you know, seven kilometer thick mantle, huge body, very resistant rocks. They're actually quite hard to destroy. Uh, and they also contain uh, sheeted dike complexes, which good geologists can recognize because they root down into the gabbros and root up into panels of basalt and move sideways into normal faults with huge hydrothermal systems. And we've never seen anything like this in the Archean. It, it's just not there. They've been misidentified a few times, but it's never been verified. So no ophiolites, which means no evidence for seafloor spreading. But that's kind of equivocal because it's hard to abduct an ophiolite. So we'll concentrate on the calcalkaline suite because the calcalkaline suite, it's a two for one, right? Not only are they supposed to be arc magmas, but this is supposed to be how the actual continental crust was built. So they're like an essential element, aren't they? So let's look at the Western Superior, just to re-summarize the story, a bunch of terrains that are supposed to be accreted from north to south, or well, moving north along a series of subduction zones with the subduction zones uh, supplying the driving force, dragging the slab and pulling these microcontinents into collision. Now, this is John Percival's interpretation, uh, his fence diagram. Uh, you see from north to south, there are these older basement rocks and on top of the older basement rocks, there are felsic plutonics that he interprets as continental arc plutonic rocks, i.e. TTGs and granites. Uh, there are also these pale green thingies that are volcanic rocks with lots of calcalkaline facies or that sit on an older continental substrate and are interpreted to be continental arc volcanic rocks. The dark green, he interprets as juvenile magmatic rocks, meaning some kind of oceanic plateau. Now, uh, uh, you'll notice there's these little yellow things there. Those are interpreted, interpreted to be arcs, oceanic arcs that punctuated these oceanic plateaus as they were being caught up in all this orogenic nonsense. Now, the, the problem with, there are many problems with this story. Uh, here you can see the north to south uh, collisional events that track the north to south collisional events of the Kenoran orogeny. Where I disagree with John is in the interpretation he gives to the actual rocks. I don't think these were arcs at all. And I'll, I'll follow up on that in a few minutes. But I just wanted to point out a, a, a palinspastic problem here. You'll notice that all these basement things, except for this one, shut off around 2800. And they all started up at 2750. Now, if they all started 2750, that means there's 30 million years of subduction here and about 40 here and about 40 there. If you multiply that by five centimeters per year, which is a pretty common convergence rate for modern arcs, well, that causes a problem because it means that each of these tiny little terrains, some of which are, are microcontinents with, with, you know, uh, that are barely 100 kilometers wide, had to migrate um, closed multi-thousand kilometer wide ocean basins that in aggregate, aggregate come out to almost 20,000 kilometers and yet manage to close in exact north-south sequence at two to 10 million year intervals. I find that absolutely amazing and uh, slightly unbelievable. Now, the important thing about subduction zones is they're a package deal. What drives modern subduction what I call active subduction, is that the huge weight of this column of cold, dense, suboceanic lithospheric mantle is what's driving the whole thing. That's really dense. It drags the whole thing down and creates the slab pull force that uh, a lot of geodynamicians believe is the major force responsible for motion, motion of plates on Earth today. So it's kind of essential that it be there if it's going to be plate tectonics. Now this this, the SOLM here is a two for one because the fact that it's cold and dense also makes it really, really strong. <clears throat> strong enough to propagate the tensional stress 
sometimes thousands of kilometers all the way to the ridge axis where it just opens, you know, because that's the weak spot. It diverges, the mantle wells up passively, melts a bit, forms new oceanic lithosphere that cools and thickens as it moves away from the heat anomaly by exchanging with the hydrosphere, acquiring water that grows the suboceanic lithospheric mantle, <clears throat> making it subductible. And once it gets beyond the base of the upper plate here, mechanical coupling with the wedge mantle drives convection there, bringing very hot undepleted mantle into the wedge where the water expelled by that heat can metasomatize it, adding all sorts of funny components, but not adding niobium and creating what we call magmatic arcs. So it's a package deal. If you haven't got the arc magmas, you've probably got not got the slab underneath. Anyway, this is the way I reason. Problem is, if you look at <clears throat> all the rock packages that are uh, claim to be arcs of various types, they don't look like arcs. I mean, they're, they're lacking the single dominant volcanic rock type of modern arcs, andesites. This is not that. They're, they're completely different things. Uh, the rock types are different. Now, I'm not the one who claims that there's lots of continental arcs in the Archean. But if there were continental arcs, well, they should look like continental arcs. And continental arcs, the, the magmas that come out of the subduction factory uh, underneath continental margins is a lot of andesite and dacite, which are viscous wet magmas that rapidly generate constructional stratovolcanoes, which even in a subaqueous Archean world would probably have poked up out of the water anyway. And these things do this because that's what subduction magmas are like. They're wet and viscous. And you get these huge tooth aprons and airfalls and lots of lahars. Lahars are actually quite easy to recognize and are exceedingly rare in the Archean record. So the, the, the argument that you hear why the, you never see these rocks is that, uh, well, it's ridiculous, really. It's that they were all eroded and that's why we never see them. Uh, th this is ridiculous because uh, all, the, all the volcanic rocks just about we see in the Archean are little slivers that have foundered into their substrate. And the substrate, which is like TTG, is supposed to be uh, continental art plutonic roots. And yet they never sample their own superstructures. They only sample basalts. They never sample the andesites. Gee, how did they do that? Well, it's ridiculous, right? They, they weren't there. That's why they weren't sampled. So, and the argument that they were all eroded is kind of a weak one too, right? Because where did all that sediment go? Well, it would go in the adjoining ocean basin, right? Uh, like just to flip back to this, at the very moment where the Abitibi Wawa and Wabagoon and, and uh, uh, Oxford Stull, uh, which are these old juvenile oceanic terrains were just about to get assembled in this collage, they were cheek by jowl with a multitude of so-called continental arcs. So where is all this volcanic material? You know, it, it should be exceedingly abundant. So imagine the ABCB approaching a, a continental margin, uh, an active continental margin that looks like Central America with all these volcanoes. Uh, these things shed huge volumes of andesitic tooth turbidite into the adjoining basin and the distals are shales. And these things are all punctuated by airfall deposits that can be correlated for sometimes for thousands of kilometers. Where is all this stuff? It's not there, right? You see oceans of pillow lavas. They're all little stretch guys like that. Uh, a, a lot of the tooths that have uh, claimed to be in these things are not at all. They're just high level class breaches that were misidentified. There are tooths, but a lot of were have been mis misidentified. Uh, a lot of the sediments are just chemical sediments, uh, cherts and ironstones that indicate starved basins with no terrigenous input whatsoever. Where you do find sandstones, they're typically at the very top of volcanic cycles, interbedded with calcalkaline rocks, and are typically fed by local basalt and TTG. And I think they're just de resedimented debrites from fault scarps. So they have nothing to do with the sediment coming off of uh, subduction zones, especially continental subduction zones. Now, there are exceptions. One of them are, are these beautiful andesitic tooths from the Wundo group that Hugh Smithy showed us a few years ago, many years ago. We see him here uh, stocking up on essential uh, uh, fluids for the field. Now, 
turning to another theme, uh, uh, the overall complexity and scale of the play tectonic interpretations that have been applied to our key and terrains. Now, if you're stuck with the usual case, which is like a, a 400 meter long and 30 meter wide uh, uh, a greenstone sliver and amphibolite grade that might have a commandite and a basalt and a calcaline bed. Uh, if you're lucky, you can see way up. If you're lucky, you have an age. Now, in, in these worst case scenarios, yeah, it makes sense to go, well, well, maybe there's a plume and maybe there's an arc. And you can draw a nice little cartoon that, that makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, the reason I went into the EBITB is that there is a stratigraphy that's been uh, the result of, uh, I think, about 100 years of work by the federal and provincial surveys, countless university researchers, uh, uh, the mining industry. I think there's enough drill core from the IBTB to go to, go to Mars. Uh, I, uh, this is probably the best studied and best preserved greenstone belt in the world, most of it at green schist facies. And it has a very complex stratigraphy that is a layer cake. You can see the depositional contacts. You can see that a certain unit here has xenocris from the underlying unit. There's a little bit of shuffling during the overprinting compression, but overall, we can trust the stratigraphy. Now, if you apply the knee jerk, uh, you know, every, every uh, basalt and, and chromatiae is a plume and every calcaline unit is an arc, you're forced to posit that in this 50 something million year interval, there were more than five plumes and seven arcs. <laughs> As Maxwell Smart used to say, I find that very hard to believe. Uh, j just to, you know, arguing from the absurd, the Tisdale arc at 2703 that was followed by the Kinner Javis arc at 2701, and then the Blake River arc at 2799, 88 something, these things are two million years apart. Now, the scale of arcs is not a free parameter. You can't just stretch it and make all these tiny little arcs, right? The, re the, the volcanic front is 100 plus kilometers away from the trench, and the back arc is typically 150 plus kilometers away from the, uh, the arc front. And we know the arc front is there because that's, you know, where the fluids come out and you trigger melting in the mantle. So we're asked to believe that we had a robust arc a plume came, obliterated it, then you nucleated a new arc. That slab moved 100 plus kilometers to create a new arc in 2 million years, seven times. I don't believe it. I don't think it's possible. Uh, now, turning to the, the calcalkaline rocks themselves, uh, this is a norm, uh, more normalized profiles. And this is pretty much the typical package. Uh, all of you who've worked in Archean trains will recognize these rock types. Here's the calcalkaline basalt, the extremely rare andesite, and the heavy rare earth depleted daysites and rhyodacites, the, so the type two and type three here. Uh, and typically in, you know, the one I worked on in the ABCV with Francois Leclerc is about 500 meters thick, and it's sandwiched between these very thick tholeitic basalt piles that are, you know, this is very, very, this is the typical Archean scenario for these rocks. And they're identified as arc rocks because they have negative niobium anomalies and uh, low titanium. Uh, I think this is a very superficial resemblance because modern arc rocks are very rarely show this kind of progressive uh, heavy rare depletion and positive strontium and europium anomalies. So they're only superficially like uh, arc rocks. Um, we'll go into more detail with this lovely thorium ytterbium, niobium ytterbium plot that Julian Pierce proposed. So all the non-geochemists, uh, uh, I feel for you because for a long time, I thought trace amount ratio diagrams were enough to rip my own head off. But then I finally learned to, to love and, and cherish them because they tell us a lot. So I'm gonna deconvolute this diagram so everyone can understand. The observation is that all modern o ocean island basalts and more fall on this array with a slope of one. And the reason is very simple. When you melt the mantle, thorium and niobium have Ds of about zero. So they're perfectly incompatible. So the ratio decreases with the slope of one because that's what the partition coefficient ratios in mantle minerals is. Uh, the only way to go off this trend is to mechanically advectively add components like continental crust. 
Now you can add it by contaminating en route, or you can add it to the source, which is what we see in modern arcs. In modern arcs, the thorium is transferred, but the niobium isn't. So you create this metasomatized source, and then you melt it. And when you melt it, it moves along a slope of one again, because it's the same residual minerals. And all modern arcs do this, just about, just about. Now you would think that if all the continents in the, that formed in the Archean, which is like 80% of them, formed in arcs, and arcs were everywhere in the Archean, that Archean calcaline rocks would look like this. Sort of goes without saying, right? Because that's the process. Well, unfortunately, the overwhelming majority of Archean volcanic rocks do not look like modern arcs. Here's the Marianas, and the data here is from that very uh, uh, layer cake Shibugamu stratigraphy we worked on. Uh, and uh, you, uh, you, I'm sure you can all see, and, and this has been pointed out by Steve Barnes and a lot of people working in Australia as well, the tholeites are rooted in the Moraboy Beret and they scatter along a diagonal array that merges with the Calcalcline Suite. Here's the Blake River for comparison, uh, along diagonal arrays that bear no resemblance to modern Calcalcline units. The only way to create a spread in this kind of diagram is to mix things. Uh, B to C there is 90% gabbro fractionation, diddly squat. A is something that looks like a TTG. It's a very evolved rhyodicitic uh, uh, block in a pyroclastic deposit in the Wakanichi formation of the Shugemo part of the ABCD Greenstone Belt. And I'm mixing it with these Bruno basalts, which are the basalts that came out right on top of it. There's the mixing line, there's the AFC line, pretty much the same. Uh, it worked and it reproduces the spread of rocks in, for these ratios. Some of you are probably saying, well, those are just two ratios. How do you know it's all the same? So here it is. It is all the same. If you take that rhyodacite and you mix it with this Bruno basalt in a 50-50 proportion, you pretty much exactly reproduce the trend of the typical uh, andesite from this Archean greenstone belt, which means that all these intermediate rocks are conduit hybrids, right? They're, they're not arc melts. So calc alkaline is not a synonym for arc related. We have to clean up our language, okay? Most Archean calc alkaline melts formed by crustal anatexis and contamination during high magma flux events fed by basalts and comadiites that pond at the moho, they heat the crust above them that's in the garnet field to form TTG that can move up those diapirs or segregate and actually form uh, type one day site flows. The basalts, well, most of them fractionate. Right? The average Archean basalt has 5 to 7% MGO. It's not a comadiate. So they all fractionated down here and gave off heat. They can erupt without contamination. They can erupt with a bit of contamination to form slightly contaminated basalt. They can mix in the conduit system to form a panoply of hybrid magnets. Or they can form shallow chambers. These are particularly interesting for ore uh, exploration because um, these are associated with the formation of type three rhyolites by shallow melting. And it also creates a shadow zone that prevents further basalt from penetrating until it all solidifies and develops a shallow chamber that uh, itself acts as the heat engine for hydrothermal cir circulation, which explains why you have the spatial association between proximal VMSs, uh, type three rhyolites, uh, mill rock, and, and so on. <clears throat> Uh, this type of model is uh, not very different from what Champion and Smithies and Martin Van Kranendonk have been plugging for years. So they were basically right. Now, just to recap, as the dominant Archean volcanic metamorphic sedimentary and uh, rock types and the geochemistry do not resemble arcs, well, as scientists, uh, we just tested the plate, plate tectonic hypothesis, haven't we? And it failed, right? So we need a new paradigm. And in the next segment, I'm going to uh, discuss an unstable stagnant lid model uh, punctuated by periodic mantle overturns. But before we do that, uh, we'll take a quick look at Venus's orogenic zones. Ha <laughs> ha, you dirty lads. So uh, Venus, uh, a lot of people think that is an analog for the Archean Earth for all sorts of reasons that will become evident in the next uh, few moments. It, it has uh, basically two types of crust. It, it's gross oversimplification, but there's basaltic lowlands fed from plume-like 
upwellings that often resurface, which is why there's so few craters and why you see so many lava flows. Uh, some of these upwelling zones are marked by coronae, which are sort of like gigantic calderas, but not quite, uh, uh, linked by uh, rift zones and lavas and things. And there are these uh, thicker crusted, low density highlands. Uh, we'll be taking a, a, a look at Lakshmi Planum here, uh, uh, which has the Freya Mountains uh, to its north, uh, named for the Norse goddess Freya because of her big hair. Uh, and uh, this terrain, um, uh, this is uh, Lyle Harris's uh, uh, Bouguet Gravity map, uh, has a tremendously low uh, negative Bouguet anomaly. Uh, zero is, is basalt, uh, minus 300 is probably felsic. So this is a lot like a continent. To the south, where the uh, where we're going to show uh, evidence for rifting, uh, a lot of very high density material at very shallow levels, uh, suggesting the whole crust was thinned. To the south of that is a string of uh, what appear what are interpreted to be plume uh, uh, foci, uh, so an east-west string of plumes that may actually represent a sheet-like upwelling. I spoke of the thick crust, uh, up to sixty plus kilometers in the. Uh, uh, in the Maxwell Mountain, and uh, uh, somewhere around 50 plus in the Freya Mountains. So very continent-like. Here's that very thin crust to the south, uh, 10 kilometers or less. What really blew my mind one Monday morning after Lyle had downloaded the Magella data set during the weekend, draped it on a globe, and did a structural interpretation. It's the first time my jaw dropped when I saw his results. So. Uh, he basically looked at all these big linears, uh, mapped them in as faults or brittle ductile shear zones with senses of motion as defined by the drag folds. I think you can all see the drag folds here. Uh, when I started doing geology, we, we'd actually do this sort of thing in first year air photo interpretation. So classic methods, very reliable. And the end result is that everything to the south of Lakshmi Planum is a rift, uh, extensional tectonics. If we focus on the northern end, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. On the left side of Lakshmi Planum, <clears throat> a lot of major uh, sinistral strike slip faults with some thrusting. On the right side, mostly dextral with some extensional basins. To the north, thrust faults with a uh, predominance of, of dextral uh, strike slip. Perhaps the, the indenter was moving a little more that way, which is why this is a transpressional margin, whereas this is a transtensional margin. I think you all see the indenter, right? I can't see your faces or your jaws on the floor, but I, I assume you can all see them. And I assume you can also see this shear sense reversal here <clears throat> and the scale. Uh, the scale is important because here we have a non-plate tectonic planet with no ridges or arcs. And yet we have a thousand kilometer wide compressional origin formed ahead of an indenter that creates escape terrains that are kinematically and geometrically the same as the Indochina block being squirted out from in front of India. So Venus has intermittently drifting continents, but has no arcs, ridges. And so it's not a plate tectonic planet, but it has moving continents that create origins. And we think this is a perfect analog for a non-plate tectonic Archean Earth. And we, th as I'll explain in the next sequence, we think the driving force is lateral outflow from mantle upwellings, pushing against the keel that underlies, or we think underlies our keen continents, just like they do most the terrestrial continents. So in the next segments, I'm gonna be outlining my model <clears throat> for how this actually works on earth. Now it's a geological model that I fit to everything I know about the Archean. It's loosely based on fluid dynamic and, and mantle convection modeling and isotopes and trace elements and everything. So I, I put it all in there and uh, I'm leaving it up to you guys to decide if you think this makes sense or if I'm utterly insane. Um, I, I mentioned that it was partly based on uh, uh, mantle convection modeling. And the first one who put me onto this is Craig O'Neill. And he generated this wonderful diagram uh, versus dimensionless time. Don't you love dimensionless time? Uh, anyway, so uh, what he shows is in the early stages of a planet, you have these huge instabilities, right? And then it smooths out and then dies off. 
So what's plotted here is Nusselt number, which is kind of an exotic thing. It's the ratio of convective to conductive heat transfer. So if you have a lot of stuff moving physically up to the surface, moving the heat in the form of magma or rapid convection, that's convective heat transfer. Conductive is when it's a stagnant lid like this, and that very little heat makes it up through the lid because conduction is terrible at doing this, right? Uh, uh, perhaps more useful are, are plots versus uh, real time. Uh, these are models from Venus, but there's a whole slew of these things, all done using different uh, uh, platforms, and they all give very similar results. Uh, they suggest that the uh, at least the first half of the history of uh, planets like Earth and Venus go through periodic overturns uh, with uh, characterized by periods of very high surface velocity and volcanic production rate, alternating with slightly longer periods with very low production rates and essentially no surface mobility. <clears throat> so let, let, let's look at this snapshot of an Archean world characterized by periodic overturns. So we're looking at a 2.9-ish time slice. Uh, we've just had an, 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 an overturn, probably the third or fourth in a sequence. Uh, with each overturn, we generate new crops of crust and generate more depleted mantle. So at this stage of the game, we've got about this thickness of upper depleted mantle that's lost all its basalt and, and granitic components to the crust, uh, including all the radioactive elements. So it's cooling because it's 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 hasn't got a lot of radioactive elements and it's exchanging heat with this, uh, this crust that's in contact with the hydrosphere. I call this ASOL, Archean style oceanic lithosphere, <clears throat> to differentiate it from modern oceanic lithosphere. And the thing is, if you look at models like those of Johnson and Sleep, these induced convection cells that are required by this heat gradient, right, uh, actually erode the suboceanic lithospheric mantle, making our keen style oceanic lithosphere fundamentally weak and, and soft and incapable of subducting on its own. While this is, on, is going on, well, the lower mantle isn't cooling, it's getting hot, right? Because it never lost its radioactive elements and it's gaining heat from the core. And at some stage, all hell breaks loose, uh, you get an overturn. I call overturns, um, up, I call these overturn up welling zones and not plumes quite simply because I think modern plumes come from a different source and, and it's easier if I have a different label for these. It's also easy to remember. Now, uh, one of the many things that we have to remember is that this is not intermittent subduction because there's no subduction zone and it's not intermittent plate tectonics because there's no subduction and there's no ridges, but it is intermittent mobile lid behavior, which means that mobile lid and plate tectonics are two different things. And this is a take home message. Just to, um, we're gonna look at these different uh, aspects of this model in sequence. And uh, I'll point out uh, similarities with uh, uh, facies that dominate the Archean world. And I hope you'll agree with me at the end that this model does a great job of explaining what we see. So let's imagine that these overturned upwelling zones come up uh, the, they'll rework anything they come up underneath, right? Because you're delivering a huge flux of basalt and chromatiite for 100 million years. And I would argue this is where you first start forming continents. Each time you get an upwelling under one of these growing continental nuclei, well, it, you form more granitoid and eventually it becomes a real protocontinent with a subcontinental lithospheric mantle root. Now, if a uh, ouzo comes up under a pre-existing continent, it's going to do the business on it. And the next little segment is going to be uh, uh, what we think is, uh, I think, the best example of a, a craton that was blasted from beneath, uh, the superior craton. Uh, this shows uh, all the color coding shows all the rocks that crystallized in this very short 20, 20 million year interval. Uh, about half of the white stuff here are granitoids. They're only slightly younger. So there's basically 60 to 70% of the crust here that crystallized in a 20 million year age window. <clears throat> now that's very short. And that's a lot of rock. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. 
this age distribution is not unique to the Northeast Superior. It's, it's common in almost every uh, Archean craton. That unimodal Neoarchean peak just dominates the signal. And I would argue the only way to do that uh, is to have a huge upwelling zone that delivers huge amounts of basalt and basically reworks the whole craton in one go. That age peak is composed, is dominated by TTGs, enderbites, which are very hot TTGs, granitoids, all with inherited zircon cores and uh, neodymium evidence and uh, hafnium evidence that suggests they're, they're basically reworked older TTGs. So during that Neoarchean peak, most of the rocks that crystallize in that window are just remelted felsic rocks from the slightly older pulse. These overturns just erase their older record, much like the, uh, <laughs> the GOP in the US. Now, we posited in the uh, geology paper that radial outflow from uh, below the uh, superior craton can perhaps explain the concentric fabric we see there. And we focus especially on the southern superior. Uh, in order to test that western superior uh, orogenic accretion model. And uh, so uh, we posited that the upwelling zone actually disaggregated a pre-existing superior craton into a bunch of ribbon continents separated by juvenile oceanic basins. Uh, here's a close-up of what we think that looks like. Here we can see the corrosion occurring, uh, the stratigraphy onlapping onto the basement to either side. If you're looking for nickel, these would be good places. Uh, these would be good places too, but they're just buried under 40 kilometers of basalt, so they're a little inaccessible. Uh, the other advantage of looking uh, slightly away from the main axis of the basin is you've got more chance of interacting with older crust uh, and contaminating the melt with silica and triggering sulfide emissibility. Uh, of course, this is very similar to the model that David Mole and uh, Steve Barnes proposed for the Ilgarn. Uh, Here's the plume. They call it plume. I call it a nuzo, potato, potato. It's coming under lithosphere. And as it goes off sideways, it stretches the overlying crust and ruptures it. Uh, in, the, in the Yilgarn case, it doesn't seem to have um, opened up significantly. In the Southern Superior, we argue it actually formed uh, an Trans, uh, short lived oceanic basins, much like a Red Sea context, with the Arabian continent being ripped off by the subjacent plume flow moving to the northeast. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the geochemistry of basalts, but just wanted to point out that uh, this gives you an explanation for, for why all Archean basalts sort of look the same, whether they be 3.5 or 2.75. They all look the same because they all come from the same mantle. They all come from this upwelling stuff. They mix with the depleted mantle to various extents, but this stuff doesn't generate a lot of juice. So most of the actual flux coming out of the mantle looks like this, which is why it's the same right, over time. Now, in terms of tectonics, um, if you have something coming up here, something has to go down somewhere else, right? Which means there has to be some sort of horizontal transfer zone. Now, in the 2013 paper, I argue that Archean continents drift because the mantle flow pattern, the mantle wind, pushes against the subcontinental of the spheric mantle, which is of Archean age. So that's plausible. In fact, most people think that continents drift today for exactly that same reason. South America is not drifting west because it's being pulled by a subducting slab, right? So we're gonna look at a little bit more on how this works. Uh, think of Venus, right? Uh, this mafic accretionary prism model is, is not new, right? Everybody and his brothers has proposed exactly this because this is what we see in terms of a structural pattern. <clears throat> the problem is if you try to interpret this in terms of a subduction zone driver, it doesn't make any sense, right? If it stalls because it's too buoyant to go down, why did it start going down? And, and how does the next slice suppose, is supposed to know that it's supposed to go down, right? Uh, is it on a mission, <laughs> right? But if you think about it in terms of a craton-driven process, then it makes perfect sense. The craton moves and 
This unsubductible stuff gets in the way, imbricates, melts at the root to form synkinematic TTGs, and we have our, accret our archaean accretionary origins. This is virtually identical to the model Hugh Smithies proposed, except that he, in those days, called it rapid plate motion. Um, I would argue that if you think in terms of craton-driven processes, you don't have to change a thing in this cartoon. It still works, and it's exactly the same as the cartoon I just presented. It's just a different uh, driving mechanism, which I show in a slightly more uh, fancy way here. We have the distal ASOL here, uh, thickness limited by the basal garnered in reaction and, and delamination of the epigite uh, uh, products that pr are produced there. Little bits of partial melt in yellow forming small TTG, maybe some day site beds. So this is the background, hot pipe, stagnant lid, oceanic lithosphere. And we argue the Abit speed is probably the best example we've got of that right now. Now, as the continent moves forward, it's going to push on this. So these blocks are going to tilt. They're going to imbricate. You could perhaps expose some rudimentary paired metamorphic belts across these reverse faults. The tail is going to be dipping down into a hot mantle. So it's going to heat up and probably is going to drip off. And this stuff is so weak that there's no way that this drip is going to drag the whole plate behind it. So this is a totally passive process. As it keeps going and you verticalize everything and melt it, eventually you fall back into your, your, your vertical uh, basalt synclines in TTG diapirs. These are formed at continental margins though, whereas the earliest variants would have been formed purely by up and down processes above ouzos. Both are actually valid ways to form continental uh, crust. Now, some will say, oh, well, it's just subduction under another name, ho-hum, who cares? Well, I would argue that's not so. These are fundamentally different things because in subduction zones, real subduction zone, the lower plate is the motor. It's the active agent. It's driving plate motion. It's generating the source metasomatic arc magnet. Lower plate here is totally passive. It doesn't want to go anywhere. It's not driving plate motion. There's no arc magnus because there's no wedge. Motion's really slow, which is why you don't get blue schists. <clears throat> now, uh, the, the key missing link in all of this story is that today we completely, we trust our cartoons. We see this, car, this arrow and we forget that continents move on their own the way they want to. They don't really need the subduction zone to make a move. They move the way they want. <clears throat> and this explains why you can actually uh, override buoyant uh, oceanic uh, uh, lithosphere, like uh, oceanic plateaus or spreading ridges. It's because the mantle is the active agent even today. And we argued that the overturn that originally disaggregated the superior reassembled it to form this north-south tectonic collage where the short collision interval and uniform polarity are predictions of the model. They're not something you have to explain away by some sort of magical process that doesn't make any sense. It's just what the model predicts. And I think a lot of a tree of or uh, arcane origins form this way. Now, I promised you something on ore deposits. So here's where I deliver. Uh, we're looking at the Abitsu B here. Uh, uh, green volcanic, pink granitoids. Granitoids can be pre synvolcanic feeding the, TT, uh, the day site layers. They can be syn or genic, produced when you compress the whole package and melt its base. They can be post orogenic or late orogenic and guided by these strike slip faults that also guide late terrestrial deposits and shoshanites and uh, 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 cyanitic intrusions that locally host uh, uh, gold and molly. But I just want to focus on the gold here, uh, these little Yellow things are gold mines. Uh, this is Valda, the Valley of Gold. Welcome to my world. <laughs> anyway, so I just want to point out what everybody already knows, and this is true for the yield garden too, is that these low gold deposits follow major strike slip faults. Uh, and it's always been kind of a puzzle. Why? Why? And why all, only the late orogenic faults and, and not so much the earlier ones? So 
Uh, Lyle did a structural interpretation of the Abitzbi using his, uh, his uh, geophysical wizardry to define these uh, lower crustal blocks and uh, combined with structural work on the fault to determine the uh, 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 sense of motion and obtain this sort of pattern for the Abitzbi. And now we're going to do a magic trick and we're going to compare the Abitzbi to Venus. Uh, we're going to look at the indenter at the north end of Lakshmi Planum, flip back to front this time to better match the Abitzbi uh, kinematics. And what I'd like you to see is that these big dextral strike slip faults here are big dextral slight strike slip faults there. And these big sinistral strike slip faults like so are these big sinistral slight strike slip faults like so. Now, if you believe this, then perhaps the Abitzbi belt is a train being expelled out from in front of an indenter and is located somewhere in here. Now, it, it's always amazed me, considering the extremely small size of our king continental blocks, that so few, few people interpret the structures they see in, ter in terms of indenter tectonics. We see this, this sort of thing in the Phanerozoic every time. Why, sh why shouldn't it work in the in the Archean. Uh, so imagine you're in the foreland of a drifting continent. Uh, think, th imagine you're in front of uh, of Ishtar Terra, or you're south of the of the Hudson's Bay block, and you have a, a, an oceanic terrain that's being imbricated by by this. Uh, the tail end of this this sucker is is dipped down in hot mantle and it's heating up and it's melting and it's giving off fluids, but um, all that stuff can't go very far because all the faults are sealed, right? Because it's in the zone of compression. Now, what do you think is going to happen when that terrain escapes the compressional footprint and these big strike slip faults go from being compressional to extensional? Well, all the fluid's going to drain out, isn't it? Right? So you're going to have rocks with a compressional fabric inherited from here on which you overprint major strike slip faults that can change shear sense and that might have releasing bends or, or uh, extensional offsets that uh, will allow all the fluids to go up along the fault and create gold. Um, the, uh, uh, the very rare porphyry, copper, moly in the Archean are typically associated with Shoshanite, Sinites, Nucatoids, that sort of things uh, that also occur along these self-same faults. And they result from basically shoving sediment down to the bottom of the pile where it metasomatizes the mantle here. And so when you locally melt that part, it moves up the same fault to give you that sort of thing. So, th so it's all pretty much part of the same package. So what are the implications for exploration? Well, we've got a problem <laughs> because the conceptual models for, for two of the main environments just don't exist, right? But in a sense, it doesn't matter because exploration geologists aren't stupid. They've developed very useful strategies that work. They don't need to know where the arc is because they already know where to go look. And that's looking at the felsic calc alkaline units because that's where you're gonna form the shallow uh, uh, magma, you know, that's, they represent the hiatus where if you form a shallow chamber, you have a chance to develop the convection cell that scavenges the metals and expel them into the water column to form exhalites that were distal uh, facies associated with these very proximal type three rhyolites that are typically associated with mill rock, which are these, these false scarp things. Uh, and, you know, they've, we've already been doing this. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not going to change your lives here. Uh, nickel chrome, again, we already know what to do, right? You look at the edges of these big basins where you can actually see the bottom of it and where there's lots of chance of contamination. Uh, the base of these cycles is always a good place to look because that's where primitive basalts might suddenly erupt on top of uh, sulfitic sediments and eat them and, and form nickel sulfide deposits like uh, Cambalda. Um, where what I have to say might be of slightly more use is uh, Potentially, this presents a different way of uh, localizing favorable gold targets. Imagine you have all these strike slip faults. Uh, if they're transpressional, it's probably, you're probably on the wrong side of the indenter. If they're transtensional, you're probably on the right side of the inventor. And you should look at the, uh, the, transten the tensional offsets. Uh, might help. Uh, 
Now, if you're on the wrong side of the indenter and you have a good guess where the indenter is, well, maybe it'd be worth looking at the other side. So to conclude, um, we argue that the three point, the, the, the Archean geology and geochemistry of the earth is best explained by a periodic overturn man, uh, model. It explains the worldwide synchronous H peaks of magmatism and tectonism. It gives you a mechanism to create continental crust from boring old Archean tholeite without having to have imaginary arcs for which there's no evidence. It gives you a mechanism to form horizontal tectonics and accretionary origins again, without having to have arcs for which there is no evidence. It explains why all the basalts coming up all look like they come from primitive mantle and haven't changed through time. This layer shrinks over time and somewhere in the Proterozoic it ran out and this process ended. Uh, this explains retarded hafnium neodymium isotopes. I won't be discussing this, but this model also has uh, tremendous implications for crustal growth histories. So uh, the 30 second take home elevator message is that modern plate tectonics actually has two different drivers. It's got a bottom up continental drift system that's driven by mantle flow. It's coming up under Africa and it's pushing the Americas west. And that started around 3.9. Subduction zones, that lid driven top down system, that started at 2.1 or so. And that's why our key and rocks are so different, is because they only had one of these engines. So, Thank you.